Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Marsha Farney and the Honorable Charles Schwartz. We, uh, we thank you both enormously for being here, and I'm going to get right to it because there are, many, are so many big issues at, at play. And let me begin with public education. Uh, uh, Representative Farney, you have been a, a, not just a teacher, but an acclaimed teacher. You've served on the state board. You serve on the public ed committee. You know this issue as well as anybody, more veteran members in the legislature. Uh, we came out of a very difficult 2011 legislative session in which public education was cut by a historic amount. Uh, I don't know that many of us thought with the school finance lawsuit <coughs> unfolding that you all were going to put money back into public education. We all thought you were going to say, well, we have to wait for the court to do its thing. We're going to hit the pause button on school finance. Right now, the House, if I understand correctly, is putting perhaps $3 billion back into public ed. Senate is putting in at least a billion five, and maybe a little bit more. We're going to go to conference. We're actually going to get some money, it looks like, back into public ed. Tell me about that. <laughs> tell, tell, me, tell me about that, and tell me why specifically you made that call, because those dollars, of course, are, sure, are hard to sure. come by. I'm actually very pleased to see some funds being directed back towards public education. Um, as many of you, I'm sure, would agree, public education is the foundation of everything we do well here in Texas. Um, it's important that we are adequately and appropriately provide that funding. I'm concerned because last time when the legislature had a very difficult session and had to make some cuts, that sometimes we may not know the full ramification of those cuts if this had not been restored. It's all, to me, it's like the drought. When you look at your trees, you may not see the full extent of the damage till the second or the third year. Right. And many school districts have lost counselors. They have lost art teachers. Right. Even the school my son will attend next year lost also a math and a science teacher. I have another school district that wanted, needed to buy a new bus and was not able to do so last time. So that superintendent calls every day to see, hey, where are you? How, how close are you? How's it running? Yep. So there were some significant damage, I, I would say damages to some of our school districts, some cuts. However, I will say that I believe that the school districts have done an admirable job of working on less when they were accustomed to having more. Right. So I don't feel like the students have suffered. I feel like you have, from what I've been told by different school districts, we are finding that the, um, say for instance, someone who is an administrator is also now driving a bus. Yeah. Or they have assumed other responsibilities. So you paint a dire picture, Representative Farney, of what the impact <laughs> of the cuts has been. I know that we don't like to play hypotheticals, but I, get, I guess I do get to ask these questions. Would you have voted against the cuts based on what you're telling me if you had been in the legislature last session? I think last session they were in dire straits and they had to make some cuts. Would you, have, would you have voted to, 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 to cut education last session if you had been there? I might not have voted for as much, but I think they had no choice to make cuts across the board to every important right. entity. It wasn't just education. Right. But I'm pleased to see this time we're able to restore some of those cuts to something as foundational and as important right. as public education. Right. And I do think, again, that the teachers have done a good job, and I think that they're very pleased and relieved to be able to restore some of those positions that they had to cut. Right. Senator, you did vote for the cuts. Yes, sir. I was uh, fortunate to be in the legislative session last time. It was a difficult, difficult mm -hmm. legislative session. Uh, if you remember, audience, last uh, 2009, 2010, we had a deep economic recession. We had sales, falling sales tax revenue. Yeah. And the legislature had to uh, um, address a shortfall of $27 billion, a historic shortfall. So all aspects of government got cut. The Department of Agriculture got cut north of 20%. All aspects got cut. The appropriations to education were diminished by 6%. 6%. It was a uh, necessary but not painless reduction in the appropriations to our public schools. Yep. So that puts in perspective about what we were having to face down in, in the legislative uh, session in 2011. Yeah. This time around, um, we are able to have a little better economic uh, forecast. We have a significant increased sales tax revenue. Uh, also the oil boom uh, in the shale play, uh, Barnett Shell is, um, is in Eagleford Shell has uh, significantly enhanced the fiscal picture of the, of the state of Texas. And um, I, too, believe that we should fund our priorities. We should be forward-looking, mm -hmm. and education is one of those priorities, right. in addition to water infrastructure and yeah. transportation. And that's what the, uh, the Senate did this last week. We funded water, roads, and schools mm -hmm. in a Senate joint resolution 
taking money out of the Economic Stabilization Fund, the Rainy Day Fund, to the tune of $5.7 billion. That was a unanimous vote. It was a unanimous vote. I and wonder, Dr. Schwartner, if you were absent that day, because I know you to be a, uh, <laughs> no. I, I, I know you to be a, a very strong fiscal conservative. It was, it was 31 to 0 yeah, vote. You were the sort of person who I would have thought would have been reluctant to take money out of the Rainy Day Fund well, I, under I normal I think the fund needs to be maintained yeah. And, yeah. and sound yeah. for future legislatures and for unforeseen problems, both right. man-made as well as natural disasters. Right. Um, but in this time, I think it was important that we address some of the long-term needs of the state of Texas. Yeah. We need to govern, we need to lead in reference to uh, infrastructure, water infrastructure in particular. Everybody in this room understands mm -hmm. the critical needs of the state of Texas in reference to growth and water. Right. And in addition, um, transportation was also something that we appropriated money out of the economic stabilization for. And then education, $800 million, of which 300 is actually for merit increases. That's uh, part of a larger package of, of education reform that's going through the legislature this time, including, right. uh, I'm sure we'll be talking on that in a second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But as far as the Senate, where the Senate is, we, in the Senate base budget, we allocated $1.5 billion more. Um, in addition, there's property revenue, our property growth um, as far as valuation of 1.4 billion, and then 800 million. So it's a significant commitment on the part of the legislature in reference to public education. You're not buying the whole cut back from the last session, but you're buying back a lot. Both of you, uh, House and Senate, mm -hmm. will will ultimately get maybe three quarters of the way back to what you mm -hmm. to what you cut. I think there cut should be a time. discussion of, of what it takes to educate a student in the state of Texas. Right, money is not. The, always the sum answer is obviously a necessary right. but not absolute component of a quality well, let me education. Ask you, let, let me ask you both about that, beginning with, with uh, uh, Representative Farney. Since you come out of public education, these will not be unfamiliar numbers to you. Before the 2011 session, uh, accepting uh, uh, Senator Schwertner's premise that money is not everything, before the 2011 session, Texas was 41st among the 50 states in Washington, D.C. in per student spending on public education. Now we are 49th in per student spending mm -hmm. uh, among the 50 states in D.C. I believe only Arizona and Louisiana spend less per student on public ed than we do. We spend about $8,400 per public school student. The national average is 11500 Should that be a concern? Do those, that sort of a statistic matter? Or is it not really about how much you spend, but what you spend it on? You took my line. That's where the money goes. I think yeah. there are specific programs that have, there's historical research that shows are valuable and important. For instance, pre-K education. Right. That makes a significant difference. Some say that by the time they get to third grade that that somehow diminishes, but they actually are catching up. Right. So especially when we have areas where there's a, a educational need and not as much exposure to things you find in different uh, zip code areas, it's good for the children to have that exposure in pre-K. I would support funding going that direction. I think yeah. it's important we also support the uh, Student Success Initiative, which I think we've had Commissioner Williams now say the money is there for that. Right. But for us to have a mandate that we need to provide remediation and not provide the funding for is, is tragic. That, yeah. So I'm really pleased to know that now the funding is allocated for that. Mm -hmm. So whenever the legislature decides something must be done, I think we must provide the funding for it. Senator, uh, Representative Farney is talking about pre-K. Pre-K is something that most people agree is a good thing. Pre-K funds were cut last session as part of that $4 billion cut. I know that some of the efforts made on the Senate and House sides this year have been to restore some of that pre-K. Yes, sir. We have mm -hmm. restored pre-K. There's uh, significant enhancements of that. Right. To be, mm -hmm. um, to be, uh, I guess, frank. What, what I mean, about the per student spending question? Come, come, come to that. I mean, what, what is, is well, you those numbers the nation, concern you? You look at New York and Washington, D.C., which yeah. are essentially double what we spend on a per student basis. Yeah. Are their results double? They're not. You look at Iowa, which yeah. has lower per student spending, their results are better. So, again, funding is a necessary but not absolute um, component of a quality education. Yeah. There is a discussion as to what amount of funding is necessary per student to provide that quality, yeah. th that education. And we have an inequitable system, which you can get into if you'd like, but also we need to, ha to have a discussion about curriculum and how that money is, is spent and driving it into the classroom instead of other ways that it's spent. Yeah. Let me come at this question of money one, one, one other way before we move on. The TEA's own rankings of schools, as you know, they go uh, Exemplary, recognized, acceptable, unacceptable. According to the TEA, this is the state's education agency, the distinguishing feature here is that the exemplary schools spend $1,000 more per student 
than the unacceptable schools. As you go down from exemplary to recognized, recognized to acceptable, acceptable to unacceptable, the one key takeaway is that you spend more, a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less. I went into journalism not to have to do math. I can do that math, actually. <laughs> it looks to me like there must be some correlation between per-student spending if the schools that are ranked highest spend more than the schools that are ranked lowest. Is that not a fair way to look at There's it? There's a correlation, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but again, is it an absolute? No. The quality of the teacher, the money getting into the classrooms, right. that's what, in my opinion, is the fundamental um, fundamental decision, fundamental way we should be addressing education. Right. Uh, Representative Farney, uh, Senator Schwartner alluded to other issues on the education reform front that have come up this session. Mm -hmm. One of those has been school choice. We were talking a lot more about vouchers at the beginning of the session than we are mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what, what is here uh, uh, before us is, a, is an opportunity to give parents who have kids in, in, in low performing schools the opportunity to take those schools out, kids out of those schools, pardon me, and move them to schools that are working. There's some discussion, disagreement about exactly the best metric for that. Can you tell me where you think this issue ends up? Will we uh, simply have an expanded choice opportunity within the public school system? Will we have something more like what we would call traditionally a voucher program? What's, what's likely to be the byproduct of this session on the school choice issue? Well, I think based on what we've seen also historically about pro-choice, which by the way, I think parents do deserve a choice yeah. in their schools, and I do think we have that, a lot of that options already yeah. through our charters and through different areas like that. And I do want to preface my comments by saying I think it's every parent's right and responsibility to do what's best for their child. Right. If it's private school, if it's home school, if it's a charter or a traditional public school, right. they have, they need to make that choice based on what their child's needs. I will say this, there is a problem though with just saying to a child that if there is a need, they're in a failing school. If we really want to make a difference, we need to do more than just say we want to give you a voucher to get from place A to place B. We already have something like that in place with a public education grant. We, th we currently have, as the last report that I saw for 2012, only two tenths of one percent of the children in Texas who already have the, the public education grant available have taken advantage of it. What they want is to stay in their home school. And I think what I would recommend, I hope that we do, is we follow through with what Senator Dan Patrick has done, which is shine the light on a very critical issue, which is failing schools, and instead go into those schools and change those schools. It's clear, based on the last seven years since they've been accruing data on this, that's what those folks want. So if you just provide the tuition, but you don't provide the transportation. It's like that scripture saying, just be warm and filled. It has no effect. It's not serving the purpose. We have seven years of data that shows that. There are other issues besides that. Um, <coughs> the private schools that I've checked with, as far as like if we were to do vouchers, I've only been able to get through to uh, six out of 10 that I've called in Central Texas. And so far, I've not found one that wants that. And they have expressed concerns to me saying, well, if we take public funds, do we have to do that public accountability and transparency that we see? Are you going to make us put our registry, our check registry online? They have valid concerns. Our party, the Republican Party, has been leading the charge on transparency. And that has been a key factor. They want their check registry online. That came before one of my committees I serve on recently, and I was supporting that because wherever public dollars go, there should be public accountability. So the House and the House that. took a vote during the budget process, uh, Representative Farney, that made it look like the House, the majority of the House, did not want yes, a traditional and, voucher program. And I will say another part of that yeah. is we want to protect the private schools and what they're able to offer. And if you look, at, in fact, I think this would be a very good Texas Tribune research project. If you were to look across the state of Texas, okay, get my take notes. If yeah. you were to start looking at the websites on their charters, I mean, excuse me, on some of our private schools, they will actually even say, if your child has special needs, if they have physical disabilities, if they have learning disabilities, if they are not English language learners, we don't feel we can help them reach their full academic potential. They're concerned about taking in children also who get free and reduced lunch. Right. So there are many concerns about protecting our private schools as well. So you'd be a no vote on vouchers? I am. I don't feel it's in the best interest. Of, I don't think we actually meet the needs 
of that particular population, if we're truly trying to meet the needs of the kids who are in failing schools, the kids whose parents rely on, on the transportation from the school buses, I think no, I don't think that meets their needs. I would be in favor of sending like a, a triage group in there, an, an academic triage group who goes in and makes strong academic changes, changes the culture of to the, the school. To the existing schools better. Absolutely. Those right. kids deserve it and we must provide that for them. Senator, are you with your colleague on this issue of vouchers? Vouchers is such a, a divisive word. I, I use school choice, and I believe that there should be options for every child to reach their maximum success. Some of those include intra and inter tra district transfers mm -hmm. for that student. Some of those include expanding our um, charter schools, and we right. passed a bill in reference to that on Indeed. the Senate side. Um, in reference to, to uh, the, vou the only voucher bill on the Senate side <clears throat> is a bill that would allow for tax credits, business tax credits, to fund scholarships for need-based and economically disadvantaged children that are in failing schools. I think that's a reasonable thought to um, allow options for children that are stuck, right. primarily in urban districts, mm -hmm. uh, in failing schools, to uh, get to a, a school, a setting, that will allow them to succeed. Right. And so that bill has not been heard on the floor. Uh, it's Senate Bill 23, if anyone wants to look it up. Yeah. But it's, uh, I think, a, a reasonable alternative as well. And I think we should, should look at all options. And right. so I, that's, that's one I look forward to, to hearing. Session, session began, Senator, though, with a more ambitious uh, uh, potential piece of legislation that we think was going to include parochial and private schools as part of the mix. In fact, Senator Patrick, Chairman Patrick, and the Lieutenant Governor announced their intention to push school choice legislation in a Catholic school in Austin, symbolism not lost on anybody. It seems as if that the pushback against this has caused the ambition of the school choice initiative to narrow to something more along the lines of what Representative Farney is talking about. I would say that's true. Yeah. I think the legislature isn't there as a reference to a, a large scale state funded Vote sim votes simply are not there. Right. Let me ask about water then, speaking of whether the legislature has the votes. There's a story in the American Statesman this morning, Representative Farney, that casts doubt on whether your colleagues in the House can get to a two thirds vote to withdraw money out of the rainy day fund. That's the mechanism required, two thirds of the House, <clears throat> two thirds of the Senate, to, to take $2 billion to jumpstart the state water plan. I know you are a yes vote for that plan, but it is a very conservative legislature. It's a very conservative house, not a very spendy legislature, generally speaking. People are eager to, to be fiscally conservative. Are you as concerned as, as people in the story are that we might not be able to get the votes for the water plan? I hope we do have enough support to create this um, water infrastructure bank, so to speak, set up. I was elected to serve my district, and yep. my district includes Milam and Burnett County as well as the northern part of Williamson. In Burnett County, I have three communities that are out of water, including an elementary school district, and they've been trucking in water. Right. Not just threatened to be, threatening no. to be out of water, they are actually no. out of water. Yes, right. and this yeah. is not to water St. Augustine lawns. This is drinking water, yeah. including, I said, an elementary campus, three communities that are in that position. Right. And this is an issue for me of not only public safety, but public health. So I must support that if I'm going to adequately and appropriately represent my district. So I, I'm definitely for that coming. But we, yeah. we, we have to have that in place. Right. And Senator, you said that the, the Senate 31 to nothing voted on this resolution. Is, is that the necessary, has that now cleared the hurdle it needs to in the House, that mechanism is passed? Well, the, again, the, the joint resolution will have to be acted on by the House. Right. And then ultimately it will be your decision in the audience. You know, the right. constitutional um, provisions require the vote of, of the people of Texas. Yeah. And y'all will decide whether or not you want to spend more money on roads and schools and uh, education. That will be the vote coming up this fall. Your perspective if, if it is it passes that, yeah. the House yeah. as yeah. the Senate passed it out. Right. Mm -hmm. the, but my, my view, my personal view about yeah. infrastructure is that Texas has done a remarkable job of being a pro-business, mm -hmm. economically viable and, and vibrant state. It has led the nation in reference to jobs by its policies that are low taxation, fair and appropriate regulation, and a judicial system that doesn't reward frivolous lawsuits. And that has um, engendered a, a vitality in our, in our economy that is second to none across the nation. And that is in jeopardy. We do not fund water and water infrastructure. We will double our, our population in 25, 30 years. 
uh, and the water needs are significant. We have a state water plan. It, we are on our fifth version of the state water plan, and we need to prioritize those, yep. um, those projects that are in the state water plan and get them funded. So I think um, it was appropriate, the legislature, uh, in this economic setting in which we have revenue to dedicate to the long-term issues, right. some resources. And that's why I voted for that joint resolution. And it's a $53 billion, 50-year plan, as it is uh, uh, on paper right now. Uh, the $2 billion is gonna essentially be a revolving loan fund that will allow projects to get started. We have to fund the entire thing now. Hopefully technology will be brought to bear on this so that the cost of the plan can come down. We can solve these problems. On the transportation side, the estimate is a $315 billion road funding hole over 20 years just to maintain current roads at the current level of congestion, both of which are ridiculous conditions because the population is growing and we're not satisfied with the roads that we have now. So what do we do about that, uh, uh, Senator? You say that there's money in that uh, resolution that the Senate passed to help jumpstart the transportation plan, but a couple billion dollars for a $315 billion plan I don't subscribe to the doesn't seem like very much. I don't think 315 is... is um, you think that number is, is too high? Yes, I do. But what the state did in reference to transportation, what the Senate did, I guess I'll be more specific, is directly appropriate money out of the Economic Stabilization Fund to the tune of $2.9 billion and put it in Fund 6, the Transportation Fund. And that will help in the transportation issues that the state is currently facing. Longer term, we have, um, we have issues, and we'll have to address those as the years go by. But if we had money uh, above what we need to maintain a healthy rainy day balance yeah. and keep our bond rating and, and provide for necessary cushion and reserves against natural or man-made calamities, yeah. an economic downturn, some, some, something happened on Wall Street, something happening across the oceans. <coughs> Um, yeah, I, I think we have the appropriate amount of reserves in our economic stabilization fund, even after yeah. spending the money out of the economic stabilization fund. So that's a pay-as-you-go model. We have the money, and what that does is actually save us about $3 billion in interest over 30 years. So you can either bond your way in transportation, you can tax, um, or you can pay as you go. And I'm, you know, I, I think it's most appropriate to pay as pay you go. You. I want to ask you about that, but I want to know, you said that the $315 billion number is, is perhaps not right. My number's from the Texas Transportation Commission. Tell me what number is the right number if that's the wrong number. I'm, you know, I, I understand that's from the Texas Transportation Commission, but I, I've heard many legislators and senators talk that that was a, a, a number, a, a wish number. An, infl an inflated number yes. relative to what the needs are. Kind of are. like an LAR, but different. Uh, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> a legislative uh, action request, right. which is uh, what they would like, not what we give them. It's a wish list. It's not necessarily the real. Uh, Representative Farney, the uh, senator talked about uh, the pr prospect of bonding capacity. Isn't it true that the head of TxDOT, uh, Phil Wilson, testified before the legislature this session that the bonding capacity of TxDOT is almost capped out? They're only a couple billion dollars away, and then they can no longer go into debt. The ability to go into debt is almost a moot point because pretty quickly they're going to have no more debt to go into. I know the conversations I've been hearing on the House also mirrors what the senator uh, just shared as far as the pay as you go. I'm hearing yeah. a lot of conversation on that as well. Yeah. Now, Senator Eltife, your colleague, Senator Schwartner, is, is such a fan of pay as you go. He's talking about an increase in the vehicle sales tax, I believe, that would allow for <laughs> funds to go into transportation and public education. He thinks that if you're going to ask people to go into debt, you may as well just have them pay now. Because effectively, if you pay now or pay later, just go ahead and call it a tax increase. That's how dire we've come uh, to be on transportation, that a Republican senator is out in public with his name <laughs> attached to it, advocating for a tax increase. Well, my, my suspicion is that you're not with Senator Elton. I am not. I do not favor a sales tax increase. Yeah. I think the way we did it was paying out of money we have now, money that's in your back pocket, and paying for your liabilities. So we don't put them off on future generations and future taxpayers. I think that's the most appropriate physically sound way of handling this issue at the current time. Um, L-Type's idea was actually to raise the sales tax a quarter percent to pay off the $14 billion in bonds that we have. Right. But long, there are other individuals that think a gas tax should be raised or vehicle registration mm -hmm. fees should be raised. Chairman Williams of the more. Senate Finance Committee thinks registration fees should be there, raised. There are some people right. that think we should issue century bonds since mm -hmm. rates are at such a historic <coughs> low. Yeah. I don't like that. I don't like putting it off on future generations. So no taxes, no fees. No and taxes, no, and, no fees. And no, no bonds put off on future generations. My understanding is the, the action that we took with our Senate joint resolution, the $2.9 billion, is adequate. To, is adequate for a period of time. Right. 
Generally speaking, Representative Farney, you're with Senator Schwertner, no fees, no taxes? Yes, but I, I do know that we have an excess of a thousand people moving into Texas every day, and especially in our area along the I-35 corridor and all the major areas, we have to find a way to do that. Now we want to look for the most fiscally sound and right. concerted means that we can do it. So I'm still looking at all the options. You know that your speaker, Joe Strauss, Republican from San Antonio, has proposed possibly increasing the fee to re uh, to sign up for your driver's license again, or a driver's license renewal fee, similar to what. Uh, Senator Schwartner was talking about on the registration of cars, uh, uh, maybe raising money that way, a user fee, basically. No, no interest? There are many options out there. And yeah. again, I'm, I'm still waiting to see what, what finally winds up on the table for discussion. And one thing I like to do, too, is visit with the people in my district. I always, I know that they've sent me there to be, um, you know, someone to voice their opinions and things like that. But I also like to hear what are your thoughts on this? So I have groups in all three counties that I will send these type of questions out to and to hear see what, what they, they say. Right. Yes, I like to get input to see what they think. Understood. Let me use the balance of our time to talk about a totally uncontroversial and uncomplicated issue, health care. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Since we've solved the problems of public education, water, and transportation in the last 25 <laughs> minutes, you're welcome. Let's now talk about, uh, let's talk about health care. We have not resolved yet the question of whether we are going to either Expand Medicaid if you're for that, or the euphemism is, uh, is um, leverage federal dollars. People who don't like to call it expanding Medicaid say we're going to leverage federal dollars. 28.8%, according to the most recent statistics available, 28.8% of the population of this state has no insurance. Doesn't count people who are underinsured or underserved. That is 6.2 million Texans. We'd like to be first in everything. Well, we're first in the 50 states in D.C in the numbers and the percentage of our population uninsured. <clears throat> Have the opportunity, as you both very well know, we've talked about this before, Senator Schwartner, to expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. A lot of dollars would come our way for a finite period of time with strings. Help us solve this problem, which is not a new problem. It's one that we've had for some time. Dr. Schwartner, Senator Schwartner, I want to call you Dr. Schwartner. You can call case. me Dr. Since Charles. Since you come out of health care on this, I want to understand why you are opposed to uh, entertaining some kind of accommodation that would bring those dollars. I'm opposed here. to Medicaid expansion in its current form. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our federal government is broke. We have $16.5 trillion in debt. We have between 40 and $100 trillion in unfunded liabilities in, in Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. In fact, in 25 years, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and interest on the debt will consume the entire federal budget if nothing happens. In addition, we have deficit financing. 40% of the federal budget is put on the credit card of future generations by selling bonds. That is unsustainable. And expanding a broken system, Medicaid, <coughs> to try to fix it only makes the problem worse. We do need to find <laughs> solutions to the un, uh, uninsured and those individuals that need our help. Um, but expanding, again, is not the right, right avenue. We need to have the flexibility afforded to us by the federal government. We spend, or we, we are taxed, our federal income taxes, and they go to the federal government, but they come back to us in Medicaid dollars with lots of strings and golden handcuffs that tell us how to operate the Medicaid state plan, which is supposed to be a Texas-centered state health plan for our aged, blind, disabled, pregnant women and children. And unfortunately, we have very little leeway about how we run that plan. Um, so that's, that's, I guess, the premise. This expansion group, I will also add, is a group of able-bodied, single, childless adults. If you look at the philosophy of, or, or the, the policy of what Medicaid was originally envisioned to do, who the, the population was originally envisioned to serve, and who this expansion group is, which is, again, able-bodied, single, childless adults. Is that the right policy in reference to what it does to that individual, individual industry and, and initiative and responsibility? So I have a, a problem in that respect as well. But there are, there are lots of discussion of this issue, because this is the health care and health care costs is the financial and physical issue of our country and, our, and, and each state. And increasingly of our state, right? Cost of health care rising in, to meet education costs as a percentage right. of the as, budget. Right. As health care piece of the pie increases, which is now 25% on, on the, on the um, 25 to 30% on the state level, it pushes out public education and transportation, criminal justice, and higher education. Right. So we as a country, as a state, need to decide what is our role as a government? What do we owe our citizens? And then again, what do 
us as individual citizens owe to do for ourselves and owe the government. Now, uh, Representative Senator Schwertner is as resolute as he always is on this issue, and the governor is resolute, not just no, but heck no, we're not going to expand Medicaid. But a number of your fellow Republicans in the House are playing footsie uh, with the federal government. They actually want to expand, or they want to come up with a way to expand without calling <coughs> it expanding Medicaid so that face can be saved politically. Where are we going to end up on this issue out of the House, do you think? I'm hoping we go with the Texas solution. I actually share Senator Schwartner's view on this about the Medicaid expansion yeah. and that it's not sustainable. I'm very encouraged, though, to see one a local example is Lone Star Circle of Care and see the kind of the quality care that they're able to provide here for the very group that they were talking about providing to. Yeah. And that is a model that is doing very well. So I think if we could focus on finding those type of solutions, I think that would be we'd be better served. Do we have the money in the absence of the federal government making some accommodation, whether a cartoon bag of money with a dollar sign on it falls from the sky <laughs> with no strings attached, which I know many people would just like, give us our money and go away, <laughs> or some other kind of middle ground. In the absence of that, if the money does not come back to us in the form of some kind of leveraging of federal dollars, this problem has been around. I'd say, again, it goes back to George W. Bush. It goes back to Ann Richards. It's not a new problem. But as the population increases, the numbers necessarily grow. Do we have the resources to solve the problem in the absence of federal dollars coming our way? I think, again, if we focus on the local solutions, I think there are a lot of good ideas out there that involve specific communities. And the model already, like I said, of Lone Star Circle of Care has been replicated in different areas, and I think with great success. Yep. So again, I, that's where I think we should focus our, our direction on doing that way. Right. Uh, Senator Schwertner, now I ask you this question. Yes. Dr. Schwertner, you know, you've been a, a deliverer of care for so mm -hmm. long. I'm a you, you know what the cost piece <laughs> of this is. Without Certainly. those federal dollars, could your practice provide the kind of care that Representative Farney is talking about to an increasing number of people. You've got to put food on the table for your family, pay the light bill. You can't do this stuff as charity work. Medicaid is, is dual funded. It's 60% funded by the federal government and 40% funded by the state. So right now, that's the state plan. The um, Expanding it will continue to put pressure on both the federal level and the state level. And I, I don't believe it's the right thing for the state to do. I desperately want a solution, but that solution has to include increased personal responsibility, changes in the benefit plan, yep. changes in eligibility. Yep. I, the individual needs to be reinvigorated in reference to their own health care choices and their own health care decisions about mm -hmm. their, their costs as well, and they need to be reacquainted with that. That is the only way, I think, to get costs under control long term in reference to, to health care. All right. Well, there's a lot more we could talk about, a lot more going on at the Capitol, but we're going to stop there in the interest of time. Let's acknowledge and thank these guys for their candor on these issues. And, um